Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You are listening to Your Money Momentum. My name is Tom Kennedy and Kevin Curley. Welcome to 2024, first part of the year. Kevin, what's going on? Just trying to survive the polar vortex. It's not going well. I think I might go back into my cave and just go back to sleep for a month. Hibernate like the bears. It wasn't, wasn't too different for me growing up in the Northeast. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's let's get into it. It's a new year, exciting times. So let's uh, let's break down the pod. Um, we're gonna do first segment. We're gonna talk about a financial planning topic uh, regarding backdoor Roths, uh, contribution limits for 2024 into 401ks, IRAs, etc. We'll jump into some some uh, timely topics, some articles, and then we'll finish with our. 24 market outlook and how we finished up in, in 23. So uh, let's jump into the first part, new contribution limits, new year, new amounts that are added. You want to kick us off? Oh, I thought you had the amounts written down. Uh, so they went up so, a little bit for inflation, I believe. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump into it. So let's just run down the list. So every year you're allowed to add more into your your 401k or IRA. So the new contribution limits for your 401k this year went up to 23,000 from 22,500. Uh, the catch up contribution, if you're over 50, stays the same at 7,500. Uh, the total amount, which we'll talk about in a minute, is 69,000 that you can put into your employer sponsored plan, which most individuals don't know about, but we will, we will talk about. Uh, IRA contributions. Uh, went up $500. So instead of 6,500, you can now make 7,000. Uh, catch up contribution for individuals over 50 are still at 1,000. So you can do 8,000 into uh, your IRA or Roth IRA or a combination of the two, uh, but not separate. That's in aggregate. That's a question we get a lot. So let's talk about the uh, Let's talk about the back door, and obviously tax brackets went up. We won't get into that, um, but brackets did change, and and amounts did change. Uh, uh, let's jump into the, uh, the 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 back door Roth, or the back door. Yeah, IRA. so Tom, this is pretty uh, straightforward. If you're in the four hundred one k and you're participating, many plans will allow you put after tax contributions into your four hundred one k, and you say, why would I do that? And the answer is, when you leave your employer you'll have two different rollovers to make. One, you can make with the 401k in the traditional way. You just roll it to your new 401k, uh, you can put an IRA, but the after-tax money is actually eligible to go straight into a Roth IRA. So this allows you to bypass those otherwise contribution limits and get a lot of money in there. So it's a great way for those that are, we'll call it income restricted from contributing to Roth directly to get some money in there. So, so let's break that down a bit. So. Most individuals know that you can do this year, 23,000 is what you as an individual, as an employee can put into your 401k. Uh, the company, depending on your company, will match you. So let's say the company match equals 10,000. You put in 23,000, just to make numbers easy, the company match do 10,000. That's $33,000 that you have into your 401k. Uh, there is something, as you mentioned, called an after-tax bucket in that 401k. That after-tax bucket allows you to put in an additional $36,000 to get you to that combined $69,000. So your $23,000 that you put in, the $10,000 the company matched you at $33,000, $33,000 minus the, the, the allotted amount of $69,000 is $36,000. So that additional $36,000 you can put into your 401k, it's after tax dollars that can go in there. Now, the benefit of it is you can keep it in there, it's gonna grow tax deferred, or what you can do is every year, you can take that after tax amount 
and you can roll it out into a Roth IRA. Now the Roth IRAs have limit in, uh, limit limitations, income limitations, um, if you're contributing directly to those Roth IRAs. Um, you know, after if you're making a combined two hundred thousand dollars, and if you're if you're if you're filing separately, I forget what the exact numbers is. It's around two ten. Um, you can no longer make contributions to a Roth IRA. However, there is no limitations on rollovers. So the way around and what we, what we call a backdoor Roth is by rolling out that after-tax money in your 401k each year, or you can wait and do it in, in a couple of years, or you can wait till you leave or retire. Um, but I think a good strategy is to do it every year, roll that out, and that gets it into the Roth IRA. Now, the big advantage of having money in a Roth IRA versus just leaving it in your 401k, well, your 401k is restricted to just a handful of investment options. You have a limited menu of what you can invest in. Usually there's anywhere from eight to 12 different investment options in each 401k. By rolling that money out into a Roth IRA and having your advisor manage it, well, it's open architecture. You can invest in, you know, you have the whole investment universe open at your disposal. It can be actively managed by, by your advisor. And that Roth money is just gonna grow tax deferred. And then as we all know at retirement at 59 and a half is all going to be tax free. So this is a plan by plan basis. Not all plans have this after tax bucket. Uh, most do from what I see now. But if you do have that option, I would highly recommend you take advantage of it um, to get that money out into a Roth IRA each year. Uh, an, another way we could do the backdoor Roth IRA is by contributing to your traditional IRA. So this is separate now. You have your 401k and your retirement plan, that's separate. You can also do up to 6,500 each year or 7,500 if you're above uh, age 50 into your traditional IRA. And then at the end of the year, you can roll that money out and put it into a Roth IRA. And that's another way we can do the, there's so there's two ways to do the backdoor Roth. And this will, as we call it, will supersize your Roth. And the big advantage to this is that it's all going to be tax-free at retirement. So if you haven't done this yet, or if, you, if your advisor hasn't spoken to you about this, I would highly recommend you sit down each year and create a plan on how to roll this money out. Because with the traditional IRA and you're rolling it out, there are some tax consequences and we have to, there's strategies around it to, to, to mitigate or to minimize those taxes, but everyone's different in a different place, but I would highly recommend taking a look at that. So I'll jump in there to just add a couple comments. First is if you're going to do the non-deductible contribution to the IRA, make sure you file it on your taxes that you made that because that establishes your basis. And so you want to make sure that the IRS knows that when you roll that money later or convert that money, from traditional IRA into Roth that you've already paid taxes on it. So you need to document, I believe that form number is 4598, um, but you can check with your CPA. And it's just a simple line item on your tax return and that creates your basis. So each year when you do that, uh, the other thing is uh, there is an ongoing debate within our industry about something called the step transaction. Um, so that is when you go and do the backdoor Roth IRA, can you convert it immediately or do you need the money to sit there for a little while and be a little invested? There is a group of people who think that you can just do it a bit immediately, no problem. And there's a group that says, no, you should wait and convert it later on because otherwise you'd violate the step rule transaction. So uh, I would work with a CPA. I would work with a, you know, an advisor who has an opinion on it and is ready to defend you with the IRS if they come knocking and say you violated that uh, as well. So uh, I do believe this is a great way to build wealth. Uh, one thing I would mention is that you need to look at your tax bracket is if you're going to do after tax money into your 401k, it's great that you get to bypass the uh, compensation limits. However, if you're paying 40% on that, it could make sense to wait and not do that into a Roth IRA and pack, pay taxes now instead to, you know, put it in a traditional and do that. So what Tom is suggesting is you max out the traditional first. And then in addition to that, you add on to it. Uh, if you think that later on, you might have a lower tax bracket. Uh, it can make sense to find other ways to get more deductible options, which could be limited based on your income. Yeah. And just to take that a step further with the taxes, let's say you, you do contribute the 7,000 non-deductible to your IRA and you wait a year and that 7,000 grows to 8,000. Well, you're going to owe tax on that 1,000 when you do that conversion. 
So some like to do it, to Kevin's point, uh, the same day. You contribute the seven and then you roll it over. So there's no there's no gains on the account. You won't owe any taxes. But the taxes, if you have some gains, are, are going to be minimal. And again, depending on talking with your CPA in a situation, usually is worth it um, either way, whether you leave it in there or not. But uh, it is a great way to start to save. And it's it, employees aren't educated on this after-tax bucket that allows you to add that additional you know, sometimes thirty to almost even forty thousand dollars into after-tax money into that four hundred one k. Yeah, it's getting more money into tax advantage accounts as fast as possible, so you can benefit from that compounding without getting taxed. And if it ends up in the Roth, great, you get to take it out without any income tax being paid. And you know, quite. I'll- well, let's end with this, Kevin. You, you probably get this question a lot. Um, everyone, not everyone, but most, I would say 90% of 401ks have the Roth option. And everyone says, well, how much should I contribute to my to my pre-tax bucket, traditional uh, 401k versus the Roth 401k? The main difference is if you contribute to the Roth 401k, you're paying the taxes now. Um, so mm-hmm. theoretically, uh, you're going to be in a higher income tax bracket now as you're working and you're in your you're in your years of, of higher contributions uh, or income versus when you retire, you should be in a lower tax bracket. So everyone's like, well, why would I do the Roth now if I'm going to pay higher taxes versus doing the traditional? Well, again, it's situational. But the one thing that the Roth does is it takes out a big variable, which is we don't know what taxes are going to be 10, 15, 20 years down the road. They could be a lot higher. So, you know, it could be a lot lower. It could be, (laughs) it's not going to be a lot lower. I can almost guarantee that. It could be though. (laughs) Um, So it it just, we could get rid of income tax. We could have a VAT tax instead. So we we don't know what the future holds is the point. But I think one way to look at this as far as rule of thumb is if you're in the mid twenties or low twenties for your tax bracket, that's kind of your gray area where you could do either one and go, I don't know what the future holds. If you're in the 10% or 12% tax bracket, I would pay those taxes now and let it grow tax free. If you're in the 35, 37 or the 40.8% tax bracket because of that net investment income tax, I would say do pre-tax and say, ah, I think it'll probably be lower than 40 sometime in the future and I can get it taxed at that point. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And also if you find yourself owing money to the IRS each year, a good way to get that bill down is to do all pre-tax. <laughs> Check your withholding, do pre-tax. There's a lot of things you can do. Give more to charity, get yep. them more deductions. Uh, all right. Um, what's next, Tom? Where do you want to go? Let's, let's, let's jump into uh, the articles. Leaving no stone unturned, it's time for headlines and the news you may have missed. Well, our first one. Uh, there's a commentary play, uh, piece written by John Plunder. It says, this year we'll witness continuing reversals of longstanding trends. And I think the longest standing trend that I can think of is the ultra low interest rates may finally be over. So we had 15 years, uh, we'll call it ZERP, call it QE1, QE2, QE infinity. Uh, and Operation now we're doing twist. QT. <laughs> yeah, Operation Twist, a great one, one of my favorites. Uh, and then now we're doing quantitative tightening, the balance sheet for the Federal Reserve is becoming smaller and interest rates on an absolute basis are higher than they have been in the past. Uh, I think, you know, one of the kind of key writers out in California is a guy named Howard Marks. Uh, He writes a memo on a regular basis and he likens it to a moving walkway in an airport. When you're going with it, you're going fast. And he thinks that the 0% rates has been that. And now these policies have changed and they're going to work against you. So a pretty good headwind. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a big change. What do you think about these long-term trends? I, I agree with you. I think the we were artificially low for, for too long for, for a lot of reasons, which we won't get into, but uh, the 0% uh, interest rate policy is, is over and may never may never come back. Um, I think a fair, fair hopefully value. Hopefully it will never come back, right? Hopefully it will never come back. <laughs> I, I hate mean, to know what happened that it comes back. You know, I think you will see interest rates come come down. Um, you know, six percent is 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 too high, uh, but zero percent is too low. So there's going to be a happy medium, probably between the three and four percent range go, going forward, which I think is sustainable. And, and it has been over the last hundred years. It's just we had this anomaly through the '60s to up into the '80s when the interest rates peaked, and then they come straight down ever since, and we're just getting back to norm, more normalized periods. 
Yeah, I think so too. So our second article is about the Eurozone heading for another downturn. This is a warning that comes from the European Central Bank. Uh, you and I have talked a lot, especially in the last year, is are we headed to recession? Are we in a recession? Are we about to have a recession? It's been an ongoing conversation since the yield curve inverted nearly two years ago. Uh, everybody's been waiting on their edge. It seems that it's come to the ECB. It, the European areas have a big drop in economic growth, uh, possibly going negative. And meanwhile, their inflation, while it has declined, is still above 3%. So uh, is this a warning sign or uh, you know, is I, this just uh, totally separate from the U.S.? You know, it, it, everyone talks about inflation. Inflation is only half the picture. Um, inflation is only relevant to where growth is. And the big question that we've been debating, whether it's domestically here or, or overseas, is does growth slow faster than inflation? If it does, that's... That's not a good. That's not a good scenario. You want growth above inflation, and I think that's going to be the key determinant. So, you know, the ECB might be the first kind of red flag that hey, their growth is dropping and inflation is still elevated. It's not the case here in the U.S. just yet, but that's going to. I think that's the determinant if we have this soft landing, no landing, hard landing. You know, i.e., uh, recession is if. Growth drops faster than inflation, which we haven't seen just yet domestically. But yeah, you're starting to see cracks in the ECB. Yeah, and I think you've seen that in the price action for the currencies this week, where you had the U.S. dollar bounce and do better, while the ECB is saying they're going to recession, uh, which to me means they have to have a monetary response, which has been them cutting rates first, as opposed to the U.S. cutting rates first, which was an expectation at the end of last year. And if that's the case, the ECB is going to do some damage to the euro as far as compared to the price of the U.S. dollar, the dollar might rise. So unless they all decide to cut rates at the same time, I think you get some volatility in currency markets, which affects all the assets that are priced in either euros or U.S. dollars. Yep, I agree. Which takes us to Article 3, Tom. Uh, emerging market debt issuance hits a record as borrowing costs falls. Uh, so we had almost a year and a half where central banks around the world were just raising rates nonstop. And the end of last year, some of them stopped raising rates. A few of them started cutting rates. And when that happened, as many companies and countries said, oh, this is our chance. We're going to go issue debt now. And it looks like a ton of them did. Yeah. You know, I, I look at, I view emerging markets as small cap companies. They only grow with, with, with capital. And the way they get capital is by, by issuing debt. So it doesn't surprise me that they're issuing a ton of debt. They may see this drop, this slight drop in interest rates as the window to get in at rates where they may think rates are going to go up. And this is a way for them to hedge themselves because they need this debt to continue to grow. And end of story, just like a small cap company grows, they have to, they have to develop, they have to they have R and D, they have cost, and they do that by issuing debt so they can grow. So I think it'll be a continued trend. Um, I don't think rates are going to go up from here, but I could be wrong. And uh, I think as rates go down, you'll see more and more debt being issued. Yeah, I think uh, the debt defaults for sovereign borrowers seems to be over. They kind of fix their balance sheets and they're back in the market raising debt. I would point out that some of the ETFs and mutual funds that follow this asset class, the yields are 7%, um, which sounds really good. Um, I mean, the U.S. Treasury is a little over five. So is that spread enough to justify the risk that you're taking on? But if the U.S. dollar were to fall uh, and the Fed does cut rates, I think you could see some outperformance from international stocks as well as international. Bonds. Yeah, well, um, and, and to your point, I mean, the, the balance sheets look good in these emerging market economies. And by the way, they're not so emerging anymore. I mean, they make up a significant yeah. amount of GDP and they have a lot of growth, especially in the middle class. Um, so I think them taking on, on, on debt is I don't think it's aggressive. I think they need to do it to continue to grow. Yeah. And support the economy. I think if you're a longtime listener to the podcast, you'll know that maybe a year ago, it might have been two years ago, it feels like it was two years ago, we talked about countries like Sri Lanka and Ghana and other countries going to say, we're, we're belly up, we're, we're bankrupt, we can't continue on this debt, we can't pay it, we can't service it. Uh, and we talked about those defaults of the sovereigns. Those are all done now. Um, and so they kind of went through their crisis already, as opposed to in the more developed markets like now. We're now having the budget conversations, which is going to be very prominent as there's a lot of elections across the world in 2024 in the developed world. Yeah. All right. Our final article. And this one, I think, is has the biggest impact, potentially, if it turns out to be real, which is um, DeepMind, which is uh, wasn't a part of Google when it started, became part of Google and is now spun off. It's kind of their AI unit uh, aims to have drug discovery times 
this is pretty powerful stuff. If you can solve for diseases, solve for illnesses in half the time you could before, and let's say AI gets a little more powerful, maybe it takes a fourth of the amount of time to develop these drugs and get them to market. I think the impact for healthcare is very widespread. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I agree. At the at the Davos conference they just had last week, um, the the coolest kid at the party this year was was AI. And for the last couple of years, it was it was crypto. Um, AI is real. I, I think it's just going to continue to grow, and it's going to help all sectors, not just healthcare. But I think healthcare is. I mean, it's it, it, people are getting older, they're living longer because of all the innovations that are going on, which is good for everybody. And I think it's just going to the AI component is just going to continue to to fuel that and help help these innovations. Yeah, I think the, the more fascinating part of that is that how they're innovating, right, is usually when you have a drug, they make it and go, hey, we think it'll work for this. And then they just try it out on a bunch of people and go, did it work? No. OK, well, what did it do? Could it do something for something else? Uh, if you replace those clinical trials with AI computers going, they're the clinical trials. Not only do you <laughs> not have human guinea pigs as far as uh, figuring out that it works, uh, you can run them so much faster. And if you think about some of the chips that some of the semiconductor companies are making, if they can do that compute, we'll call it big compute, faster and faster and faster, uh, assuming that their data is right, and I don't know, I'm not a chemist, I'm not a biologist, but if they can put all those inputs in and run through all that, I think the chance for scientific breakthroughs are massive. Oh yeah, I mean it takes. I don't know the exact amount, and I, I was gonna. I meant to look it up prior to this, but I mean to go from pre preclinical trials all the way through phase three it could take years for some of these drugs, and this is just gonna. I mean, you're just gonna see the velocity go through the roof on how quickly I think this can impact the efficiency of, of these drugs. All right. Any bold predictions? For 2024, I'll tell you what you, your prediction for a year end was a lot closer than mine. You had 5,000 on the S and P 500, and we finished uh, just shy 48, 48 and change. So um, let's talk about last year. How did we how did we finish up last year? Bringing you a look at the past month and what may come. Here's the latest financial update. Yeah, uh, broad market index. So the S&P 500 up about 24%. Uh, some international places actually outperformed. We had a little bit of performance from small cap in the fourth quarter, which we hadn't seen in a long time. Uh, I think the funniest stat from 2023 as far as fixed income goes is that the 10-year treasury ended one basis point different than where it started. And there was a tremendous amount of volatility throughout the year, only to end up where it started. Yeah, I mean, you, TLT, which follows, you know, long term treasuries. I mean, at one point it was more volatile than, than Bitcoin. I mean, you had some massive, massive swings <laughs> in, in, in fixed income. Um, but it, it's an interesting year. The S&P, to your point, finished up uh, 25. But you take out the top top eight or you look at something like RSP, which is the equally weighted. I mean, you had half the return. So it was a handful of stocks that can, the breadth in the market wasn't wasn't as great. Um, you know, you look at some of the other, you know, breaking up by, by market cap, you know, small caps lagged, you know, small cap value in particular was the one of the weakest performing uh, style boxes last year. And I think you're going to see that reversion back to the mean. I think you'll see the reversal. I think you'll see small caps and value uh, a healthy rotation out of the high, high growth names back into uh, some of the more value oriented names this year. Yeah, let's wrap for predictions for this year. Uh, I think the biggest theme you'll have questions about, and I already received a few is, Tom, how does investing change during an election year? I mean, typically what you see, volatility usually is, is, is pretty low leading up until November because no one knows what's going on in Washington. So there's not a lot of movement. So volatility tends to be low and you, you tend to have a stronger year in, in the election years. At the end of the day, the stock market doesn't like uh, big change. So if we see a lot of gridlock in Washington and not a lot of change, I think that'll be good for the overall overall market. Yeah, I think that there's some, we'll call it Trader's Almanac stuff you can look at, but mm -hmm. it's usually next year is the trouble year, is the first year of a new president or the first year of a reelected president tends to be the toughest one. And the reason for that is they usually do everything they can to get reelected. And so that usually means juicing the economy. And as soon as the election's over, that all goes away because now they've won. 
I think the best example is Richard Nixon did everything he could, got reelected in a landslide, and then the economy just fell off a cliff. So I wouldn't be surprised if the current incumbents, regardless of party affiliation, do everything they can to make sure that things are okay until November. I can't remember the exact date, let's say November 3rd, and go, okay, now we're going to let it collapse, but uh, not until that happens. Yep. I, uh, I agree with you. I think you're going to, I think this year you're going to, you're going to see lower rates, you know, the market's pricing in, you know, almost 200 basis points um, lower in, in, in rates. I think one of the drivers for lower rates. So you look at the total spending last year of 6.1 trillion. There's an other category of $950 billion. That $950 billion was interest rate expense, <laughs> was just the interest carry on our debt because rates are so high. So they, we can't continue mathematically at this pace or we're going to just bankrupt our, our country. So the Fed, as we continue to talk about, is in a really tough spot, but they're going to have to eventually bring rates down and hopefully it's sooner than later. But, you know, you had a lot of Fed comments uh, this week and, and last week kind of pivoting back to more of that hawkish tone, which is why you saw some volatility pick up. But it's going to be the same story this year. It's going to be it's going to be interest rates. However, typically the stock market doesn't react twice on, on news. So I think it's I think we've kind of grown a little callous to the interest rates and, and the Fed speak. But um, a lot of things went right last year um, and that leaves us, you know, we're priced pretty high at, at the overall stock market. So any reverse in, in tone or if they decide to hike rates, which I don't think is on the table, but if they do, it could it could get real ugly. But I think we're going to think this year is not necessarily interest rates. It's more of growth. This is going to be the year of growth and what growth looks like. We're going through earnings right now. And if we continue to see earnings do well um, and we and growth doesn't fall off, I think we'll have a good year. Yeah, I think we're in a recession right now. I think the employment picture is going to turn quickly. I think if you look at the revisions they made the last few months, we actually have declining employment. And uh, that would be my bold prediction. It's just I don't know how bold it is, considering that people have been talking about it for 24 months. But instead of saying we're going to be in a recession, I'm saying we are currently in one. And we look back six months from now. Oh, we were in a recession. I can't believe it. Well, let's just yeah. And I don't disagree with you, but let's look at just some some numbers. So. Corporate balance sheets and companies' earnings actually look pretty healthy for the most part, which doesn't look as great right now. Where some of the red flags are, in my opinion, are is the consumer balance sheet, which not a lot of people talk mm-hmm. about. I mean, you're again, you're just we talk about this in other podcasts. You're starting to see auto loans um, defaults and delinquencies, 30-day delinquencies pick up to, you know, you're at seven and a half percent, credit card delinquencies, eight percent that are past 30 days. Student loans are, are pretty much flat. But if that conti- that trend continues, um, you know, people are, are, are spending more, they're putting on their credit card, they're blowing through savings, and they're not as healthy as they were uh, pre-COVID. So if that continues, um, you could start to see de- you know, defaults across the board pick up. And that's when I would start to get nervous. But we're, we're keeping an eye on that. The, the trend is what's scary, not the absolute levels just now. Yeah, I think that that's fair. I just, if you look at the employment picture, it's just been declining and declining and they keep reporting top line positives. But if you look back at like, even to September of last year, we saw jobs actually go negative based on their revisions after the fact. And so even though at the beginning of January they said, oh, we grew more jobs, um, the last five months in a row, they've actually revised it and said, no, we lost jobs. Uh, so I don't know what's going on with that. It seems shady. I don't know that I can prove anything about that. But uh, if you look at any time employment finally goes through and gets negative, uh, typically we're in the recession. So, uh, you know, American Funds has an interesting theory that we're in a rolling recession and it's just hitting each sector by sector. And so, you know, one gets hit and they go to the next one as opposed to all of it going down at once. So yeah, there's something not right. How about that? <laughs> yeah, no, I uh I agree with that. Um, I, I think, you know, another tailwind, I, I actually believe there's more tailwinds than headwinds this year in the market. Another tailwind is that we have over $7 trillion in money market. You know, everyone thought five to five and a half percent looked real, real good last year, which it did until the market was up 20 plus. Um, mm-hmm. So you're going to have all that money start to hopefully be deployed back into the market, which again, will just be another, another tailwind if, if people start getting back into the equity markets. Yeah, I think you'd have to see those money market funds start to yield less. 
Uh, I think the people who are happy with five while the stock market went up 25 will be happy with five again this year. But if that number starts to go to two and a half, goes back to one, they're going to look for somewhere else to put that money. And I think that's the catalyst where you go, okay, here's the blow off top, the last kind of hurrah for the equity market is seeing all those people shift from uh, money markets into equities to go, well, I can't make one. I got to make more than one. But I think a lot of those folks are happy with five and just going to hang out right there. And you know that that five is, is misleading too. One, if it's in a, if it's in a, uh, an after tax account, after you, you know, money markets mm-hmm. are taxed at ordinary income. So if you're in the highest tax bracket, you're closer to three and a half. You factor in inflation, you're, you're basically just even. Uh, um, so you're, you know, the, you're a little ahead, a little ahead. your real return, you're at like 50 yeah. basis points. Um, you know, if you're in a yeah. qualified account or a pre-tax account, a little bit different, you don't have to pay the taxes on that, but still your, your real return on that after inflation is only 2%. So you, you know, the five looks good, but it can be a little, little misleading when you see these CDs and, and money market accounts. So you just want to make sure that it, it plays in your overall plan. It's not a bad place just to park some money, but you know, long term, we believe in we believe in the stock market and the equity markets. And you, as long as you're properly diversified, um, I think this year, I think this year will be a good year. I, I would predict um, high single digits on on the S and P. Yeah, that's great. Well, I hope that you're right. I think that every analyst out there is predicting five thousand now. So I'm glad they finally caught up. Uh, I wish I was more optimistic. I think maybe we grind higher, like you just suggested. Uh, I. I I don't know if there's another 25 available this year, but we can all hope that there is. All right. Well, that's uh, that's a wrap. We'll pick it up in a couple of weeks, mm-hmm. go over some more financial planning topics, headlines, and, and market outlook. All right. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Kevin. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum, brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.